Give, most of my shows are free. I try to make them free because it's all about changing the community. But the hard part about changing the community is getting the community and the higher ups to believe in what you're doing that is changing the community. Mm -hmm. I just finished a project with Freehold where we went into the prison system and helped them do a show. Those women was like you changed our lives, but and they probably would get out and try to find theater. But how do you convince the mayor that this is actually ending violence? Because we went in there for six months and did the show. That's the hard part to get the media and the community to believe in that we are investing in change. So what are the barriers in our community to getting the community to actually value? We talk about it in monetary terms all of the time. We talk about the fact that we are an economic engine, that we're driving $795 million in you know, tax revenue, that we're driving over a billion dollars across the state. The 29, I mean, you know, the numbers, we can roll off of our tongue, but very rarely do we hear people talk in, the, in terms of, I value these six artists, or I value the art, period. Well, I think we are, you know, if you look at the for-profit sector, they actually try to find what they share in common. They don't try to really distinguish themselves from one another. So you have the Chamber of Commerce that represents Boeing and the printer on the corner. Because what they share is a business model that says we have to end the year with a dollar more than we started with. And we have a business model that says all of us, whether it's the university hospital or whether it's Evergreen Treatment Services or whether it's a Seattle rep or Sharon on our own, we are, we are, what we share is the desire to add more value at the end of the year than we started at the beginning. And but we don't come together and make the case for what the nonprofit does, for what this, this sector in which we put all of our values, our health, our education, social welfare, social justice, education, religion, all the things we really believe and care about are in the not-for-profit sector because the marketplace isn't kind to those things. The marketplace is great at creating capital. It is not great at creating value. So we don't articulate what we do, we keep trying to articulate what we do in terms of what business does. So we do, there are huge numbers of our impact, but our impact financially isn't anywhere close to what the for is doing. So we're always making the case that actually undermines us at the same time. You know? So I think we have to kind of join together. We do have to get better at talking about what it means to be driven to add value. And in the crassest sense, and I don't mean to, to you know, miss, not appreciate what the value of the for-profit for sector in providing a healthy economy, but businesses announce their profits at the end of the year. What they measure themselves on is how much value they pulled out of the community to keep for themselves. <laughs> and what we do is we're trying to say how much value have we pulled from ourselves to distribute out in the community? We've had a fun It's There's an interesting uh, shift going on to some extent, though, in that I think that in the private sector, we see efforts to try and express the work that's being done in the private sector, often with more discussions around value as well. And we see that. That's what we're here. Well, they're trying to do that. And I also think. Uh, that sometimes um, we've assumed that there isn't that value component in the private sector when many people who work in that sector would say they see themselves providing value as well beyond the, beyond the capital. And so they I start with capital, they add value to create capital. We start with value, we add capital, capital to create more value. We're both dealing yeah. only with value and capital. And so. I think part of why I just kind of feel like this is an interesting place is I worked with a group that was looking at the intersection of technology and, and arts and in terms of content. And the people who came to the table, um, many of them thought of themselves as artists and creators and being in creative, 
very much in the creative aspect of our economy. And yet, they very seldom spoke about the nonprofits. And the nonprofits who were at the table tended to keep a very low profile, even though they'd been invited to be there. And I thought it was a very interesting moment to think about that mix. It doesn't tell us directly what, what that means for the future. But these folks were saying, of course we use artists in our work. Of course we're about creative work. Of course we're about bringing value in terms of, of all kinds of things. And we think we can make money, we can monetize it in ways that work. And I guess I just think we're at a point where for certain, for many people entering the workforce, they don't see the hard distinctions between nonprofit and for-profit that we have, have built, in a sense, over the last couple of decades. And uh, so those boundaries maybe don't have the same meaning that they have. But, though, of course, unless the IRS changes 501c3 status, that will always play a significant role. But I think that boundary shifting is happening in some ways that have implications for the nonprofit arts. Vivian, I would add, I think one of the barriers to getting this through is, is our own industry. I think we've done a really bad job at advocacy uh, at a government level with our state uh, and with our city. Um, a, 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 a great proof of this is look at the Seattle Arts Commission. Um, our state's budget overall has doubled in the last 20 years. Um, if you look at 20 years ago, what the State Arts Commission's budget was, 20 years ago, it's the same today. In fact, it's lower. Do you think that's the case with the wine industry? No. Do you think that's the case with you know, the airline industry here years ago? No. And yet, we let that happen. That's happened on our watch. All of us up here are guilty of that. Um, so, to you people in the audience, please pay close, close attention to the legislature. Um, hold people who represent us accountable to funding appropriately. In, in the Arts Commission, at, at, you know, at, at a similar level than they, than they were 20 years ago, is, is not kosher at all. Uh, as the representative from the State Arts Commission here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is the problem with it? Exactly. I think it's all my fault, actually. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so I, I, I joined the State Arts Commission just this last year, and I joked that the reason was because I, uh, I was invited there because I know how to use Facebook. Um, <laughs> and and what, when I use that as my introduction, I'm kind of poking a jab. Uh, at the State Arts Commission, because uh, <laughs> it's not a joke, it's true. Nobody on the State Arts Commission knows how to use Facebook, right? Like, nobody within our advocacy and leadership structure has moved into the 21st century. Um, and I, I don't want to say that absolutely, but it's true that we are uh, working with some really old messages, some really old technologies, and some really old ideas of what it means to produce artwork and talk about its value in society. Well, even worse, I mean, to Vivian's point, I've experienced colleagues who are scared yeah. of saying anything about our great value, whether it's economic, artistic, lifestyle, in Western Washington. They don't want to bring that to, to legislators' attention for fear of being cut from it. The, the fear you know, is I have no, no use for people like that anymore. No use for attitudes like that anymore. So, so Josh is on the board of the Washington State Arts Alliance, the advocacy organization. I'm on the board of the Washington State Arts Commission, the funding organization. And uh, I think we're both feeling some frustration with this, with this year that's happening.